Good morning. Great songs. It's hard to preach when your eyes are full of tears of joy and just singing good songs. Well, it's a great privilege for me to be with you this morning to bring you the Word of God. Um, as we enter into this Christmas season, I thought it'd be appropriate uh, to begin really a series of sermons by the elders during this month of December while Ken's on vacation by highlighting the glory of our Savior using the book of Colossians. And I want to focus especially on Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, where Paul exhorts the Colossian saints to set their minds on things above, as David mentioned. Fundamentally, Paul is commanding the Colossian church and us to constantly live with an eternal perspective with our eyes fixed upon Jesus, the one who has saved us, the one who changes us, the one who is presently seated at God's right hand, the one in whom we are hidden in God's very presence, and the one who is coming again in glory, a glory in which we will share. So it's my desire this morning that there will be uh, a total immersion, all of us immersed in the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus, and that His beauty as set forth in these few verses will set the tone for your holiday celebration this Christmas as we seek to worship and adore Him at this special time of year. Well, let's just, before we look at our verses, uh, quickly set the context and I don't have the luxury of a long introduction like Ken does, because we only preach once a year. You've got to be careful. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> well, but we do need to set the context. The book of Colossians, as many of you know, was one of the so-called uh, prison epistles, along with Ephesians and Philippians and Philemon, written by Paul when he was imprisoned in Rome. Probably... Uh, the letter to the church at Colossae was written about A.D. 61. And like her sister epistle, Ephesians, Colossians can be basically divided into two main parts. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul gives us significant doctrinal truth concerning the Lord Jesus and His all-sufficiency for us. His focus is on the infinite glory of our Savior and our position in Him as a result of God the Father's gracious, saving work. In chapters 3 and 4, then, Paul primarily focuses on our practice. And really, my text this morning with you, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3, is kind of a conclusion to the, to the doctrinal section and kind of a, uh, an introduction and movement into the practical. It's a, it's a key transitional passage. But 3 and 4, then, our practice as Christians which results from being in Christ, our position. The book of Colossians is about Jesus Christ, the head of the church. It's all about Him. And it is important to note, though, that the great doctrinal truths Paul shares about Christ, especially in chapters 1 and 2 of his letter, are given with the purpose of combating the doctrinal errors being promoted in the church by false teachers. That was very true in most of Paul's letters. He had to combat error. And the best way to refute error is what? Forcefully, clearly proclaiming the truth. And Paul does that in this letter. In chapter 1, Paul gives thanks to God for his gracious saving work among the Colossians and prays for them that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He prays for them. He wants them to be thankful to the one who has transferred them into the kingdom of his beloved son, rescued them from the domain of darkness by his wonderful grace. 
he then highlights the preeminent glory of Christ. It's foundational to everything he's trying to communicate to them. The preeminent glory of Christ as the firstborn of all creation and the head of his body, the church. And he does this, I think, because he wants to cement in their minds and hearts that Christ's person and work alone are absolutely sufficient to save, sanctify, and glorify His people. And that's, as you'll see, is set in contrast to the false teaching which downplays and denigrates that. He also declared to them marvelous truths. For example, the mystery of the miraculous new covenant truth that they were indwelt by Christ himself. He said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amazing. He encouraged them with unity of heart to seek, to know Christ more deeply, the one who is indeed God's mystery himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He's building this case for the sufficiency of Jesus Christ for us as his people. Paul again and again focused the Colossians on Christ as he combated this false doctrinal error, false teacher's promotion, and you can glean it from the text, we'll look at a few, of a legalistic approach to God, a man-centered approach to God which really subverted the absolute sufficiency of Christ to save and sanctify. Oh, yes, he's part of it, but he's not sufficient to accomplish all, every aspect of your salvation. You can see there, there's this back and forth argument by Paul in chapter 2, especially as he exposes the darkness of false doctrine with the brilliant light of the truth. And, and just to hit some of this, not to read the chapter, but just to hit some of this, I want you to kind of see that because it leads up to our text in chapter 3. So in, in verses 1 through 3 in Colossians 2, he, he encourages them to seek a deeper, a deeper knowledge of Christ, a deeper, true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. And in verse 4, contrast, he says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. See, this was going on in the church. Comes back to Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, being firmly rooted in him, built up in him, established in your faith. Verse 8, back to the error. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Back to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He's, it, we'll come back to this text. In him you have been made complete. He is sufficient for you. And then he goes on to talk about how you have died with him and been raised with him. And that will impact your life and the way you live. And it's the foundation for the exhortations he picks up on in the final two chapters. The certificate of debt has been canceled in Christ. Back to the air in verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Day. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self abasement and the worship of angels. Back to Christ. They're, they're not holding fast, he says, to the head, to the head whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth which is from God hanging on to the head who is Christ. And then right before our text, he says this about their teaching. And he's exhorting them, of course. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, 
Do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, he says, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. No value at all. And that brings us to our text. And really, when we get to these few verses, the beginning of chapter 3, this is then the capstone of Paul's argument against this false teaching. It's the capstone of his argument as he destroys their foolish teaching. And what does he do? He decisively draws the Colossians' attention and ours to the beauty of our enthroned Savior. Let's read the text. Therefore, remember the context. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So let's use the remaining time that we have, and I'm checking, because we could spend a long time on this text, couldn't we, to just consider some of the significant truths given in these wonderful verses. Note the first word of verse 4, or I'm sorry, verse 1, therefore. So Paul is bringing a conclusion based upon the things he has just been talking about, which we did review with you. And this conclusion also contains an exhortation to his readers to embrace the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ as their all in all in every area of salvation from first to last. He essentially is commanding them to be done with this foolish doctrine, this man-centered approach to God, this legalistic approach to God that he exposes in chapter 2 especially, and, 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 and to fix their eyes of faith on the resurrected, enthroned Christ. And having just referenced their dying with Christ to the elementary principles of the world in 2.26, he now speaks of their having been raised up with Christ. What's he doing? He's driving home the point he made in Colossians 2, 9 through 13 about the sufficiency of Christ. Let's read that one text again. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete. And He is the head over all rule and authority. It's about Him. Being in Him. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive. God the Father made you alive together with Him having forgiven us all our transgressions. What a great salvation, but it's all about a person. Why would you want to go back to something so dark and worthless? These things are echoed throughout Paul's letters. I'm sure you can think of good cross-references. For example, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, remember that? He says, you were dead. You were born dead in trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. And that was a staggering declaration to the Jews of his day because they didn't see themselves as dead. Their theology was, well, we're wounded by God. And we need the law to take care of that wound. And we have the ability to keep the law and deal with the evil impulse within us and produce a righteousness that will please God by obeying the law. No, Paul said, you're dead. You can't do anything. 
You need new life. You need to be made alive with Christ. It says the same thing. We won't read it, but Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4, right? You've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. Every time we have a baptism, we refer to that text because what happens up here symbolically is a reference to what's going on spiritually inside of a person in Christ. And so based on this indicative concrete reality concerning their union with Christ, that they have been raised up with him, he gives them command. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Well, keep seeking is a present tense imperative or command which means that this is to be a continuing, ongoing reality for the child of God. There's never a time when this is not to be true for you. The verb itself means to devote serious effort seeking, to realize one's desire or objective, to strive for something, to aim for something. To obtain something it has to do with effort, serious effort. So what is it that we are to be continually seeking? Well, the things above. And, of course, Paul does not leave us wondering what these things primarily concern, does he? He makes it clear what the focus is to be with his next phrase, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The constant preoccupation of the child of God is to be the Lord Jesus. That's what he's saying. One commentator put it this way, since you have shared in Christ's resurrection your aims, ambitions, in fact, your whole outlook are to be centered in Him, in that place of highest honor where God has exalted Him. The focus of our mind's eye of faith is then to be heavenly, where Christ is. Think of it, people. Right now, in His full human nature as the Son of David, Jesus is with God the Father in heaven. This is the place where he presently exists. In his divine nature, of course, he's everywhere present. I'll never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He's with us. He's in us, and we are in him. But as a human being, he is in heaven. And because this is true, Paul commands us to keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Paul means he wants us to never take our eyes off of the present reality of who Jesus is. And we're going to talk about these things a little bit. Who Jesus is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what will he do in the eschatological future. He's the focus. He's the focus. So then, let's spend a little bit of time doing some reflecting on what Paul draws our attention to. First, of course, he tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. We just have to pause. (laughs) This is an unbelievable, miraculous reality. We, We don't... That's why we're told to think about it. And it demands our deep, worshipful reflection, people. Paul declared earlier in Colossians 1, 15 through 17, and this is foundational to what we're going to talk about, uh, my favorite text probably in all of Scripture, that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, or in him, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things, get this, have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This helps us to understand, I think, that before the foundation of the world, God the Father had determined to execute a divine plan in history and on into eternity that sets the beauty of the second person of the Godhead on display to the praise of His great name. And is it any wonder that He would devise such a plan when from eternity past the Father has infinitely delighted in and loved the beauty of His Son as the Son has reflected back to the Father the infinite glory of His own essence and God delights most in the beauty of his own essence, and he's seen it forever and ever and ever in the face of his son. It shouldn't surprise us that the plan is about this person. So, when you read that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, from the very beginning then, this is where God the Father has been going moving to bring about the glorious enthronement of His firstborn Son. The eternal union in His person, and this is unbelievable, of God the Son with the Son of David to set His glory on display for all to see. How do you see God? What did Jesus tell Philip? Philip, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. If you've seen Me, Philip, you've seen the Father. You see God in my face. In my face. God has been moving to bring this about. To set his glory on display for all to behold. So, here are a few texts that highlight this great purpose of God as Scripture unfolds. If that's before time and now we... Have it being a reality now? Here's some thoughts. He is the seed promised to come who would crush the head of the serpent. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah and the bright morning star that would come forth from Jacob. He is the eternal fulfillment of Davidic covenant promise, the one through whom David's house and kingdom and throne would endure forever. He is the one to whom the Father promised to install as king on Zion, his holy mountain, and give all the nations to him as his inheritance. He is the glorious Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, given the kingdom by the Father, whose kingdom when established, it says, will crush all the other earthly kingdoms and fill the whole earth and endure forever. He is the fulfillment of Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He is the baby born to Mary, conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit, the Son of the Most High, to be given the throne of his father David, who will rule over the house of Jacob and the nations forever. The kingdom will have no end. He is the one whom the Father declared, This, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He is the one to whom the Father has given all authority in heaven and on earth. Remember the Great Commission? He is the humble, suffering servant who did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And as a result, he is now the resurrected, ascended, glorified Messiah, 
exalted by God and is presently seated at his right hand, having a name that is above every name, the one who is the radiance of the glory of God and upholds all things by the word of his power, the one to whom every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. Dear saints, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Right? Let me just say here at this point that following this command involves engaging your mind. We, we saw what the word seeking means. We're talking about devoting serious mental energy in this seeking. We live in a culture that doesn't like to read or think, don't we? Visual, sound bites, entertainment. Who wants to read or think, especially about truth? thinking rightly and deeply about Christ and God's eternal plan to glorify His name through His exaltation will require you to fight for it. You have to map out some time. You have to be willing to turn off the TV. You have to be willing to give up something else to do this, people. hey, you have to know your Bible. You have to know the Word of God. You have to be a hard-working student. You never stop learning if you're walking with Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. But dear people, let me tell you, it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth it. Because the more you behold his beauty from this book, the more you will become like him. Changed into his image, Paul says. From glory to glory, beholding the glory of God in his face. And the motive is not about being a a scholar, is it? What is it that should motivate this? Love for him. Don't you want to get to know him more deeply? See more of his beauty? So let me ask you, are you seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God? Is that true for you today? Paul's going to go on and talk more about this. But is it true for you? Or is everything else more important to engage your mind with Boy, may God help us to be seekers, right? People are so well-versed in so many things, but they don't know him. Keep seeking the things above. In verse 2, Paul repeats, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, we'll make it. In verse 2, Paul repeats the command of verse 1, but says it a little different way. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. Set your mind. Here Paul specifically speaks about the believer's mindset. He exhorted seeking, but now he's getting specific. It involves your mind. The Greek verb phroneo, which here is in the present active imperative form. It's for all you dear men who are learning Greek. I thought I'd throw that in there. means, in this context, to give careful consideration to something, to set one's mind on something, to be intent on something. It really has to do with what you engage your mind to think about. What do you engage your mind to think about? And here Paul contrasts two Radically different mindsets, similar to Romans 8.6. Remember Romans 8.6, the mindset, same word, on the flesh is death. But the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. 
So let's consider first the negative in, in our context. He commands those in the church to not set their minds on the things that are on earth. In this immediate context of Colossians, he is doing battle against the doctrine of the false teachers that undermines the absolute all-sufficiency of Christ to secure and bring about every aspect of our salvation from justification to glorification. The false teachers are promoting a man-centered, works-oriented approach to God according to the elementary principles of the world. Paul says, in Christ, you have died to this foolishness. The false teachers are trying to get them to set their minds, to give careful consideration to these principles, to really get into it. They want them to use their minds to intensely pursue and consider these things they are teaching, which Paul says looks good. Have to, they have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, which characterizes so many of the world religions on this planet. But he says they're, they're not, they won't change you. They won't change you. They're of no value against fleshly indulgence. And in fact, to go down this path, as we've seen, with these men will result in being deluded. It means moving back into the domain of darkness. It will result in being defrauded and losing the ultimate prize of eternal life itself. To go back. He said in 2 verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Dear people, are there these kind of teachers in the church who want to distract you from the all-sufficiency of Christ? Yes. Yes. Yes, there are. Who want to focus you on the wrong things? To please God and approach God and walk with God? Yes, there are. We have to be aware. On the positive side, then, we are to do just the opposite of what the false teachers desire. We are commanded to set our mind on the things above. We are to constantly have the eyes of our mind and heart fixed upon Jesus. Isn't that a good thing to do? Man. And in a very practical sense, let me just share my heart with you. I believe that this means that as we saw with respect to seeking, it means that we engage all our mental energy as much as we are able in our finiteness and still being hindered by sin to behold the fullness of the beauty of the person and work of the Lord Jesus as set forth in all of Scripture. Now, we're all at different places. I understand that. But this command doesn't play favorites. Everybody in here is called to do this. Is called to do this. This is really nothing less, I think, than loving God with all our mind. Aren't we commanded to do that? To love God with all your mind? It means having a mindset that is fervently, fervently intent on laying hold of all God wants you to see of the beauty of His Son gleaned from Genesis to Revelation as God progressively unfolds it. The whole book is about Him. Isn't it? I think it means, big picture-wise, tracing the great theme of his kingship and kingdom from Genesis 49.10 to the last chapter of the Bible where he is seated on the throne of God and of the Lamb forever as the root and offspring of David in the New Jerusalem. Genesis to Revelation, the king. God wants you to see him. It means tracing the great theme of redemption and the Redeemer, not just the concept, but the person. 
from Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, again to the last book of the Bible where we see the glory of the lion who is the lamb standing as if slain in the midst of the throne of God who alone is worthy to take the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne with the resounding song of heaven declaring, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Dear people, it's about a person, the king, who is the lamb, the lion, who is the lamb. In this particular context, let's narrow it down from the sweeping ideas. Our focus is drawn to the risen, exalted Christ, seated at God's right hand in heaven. So let me ask you, let's just, what kind of thinking might your mind engage in as you meditate on this glorious truth? Have you even stopped to think about it? You know it's true, but what about thinking about it? What kind of thinking? I'm telling you, just contemplating him there in your mind's eye, fueled by Scripture, could occupy your meditation until you take your last breath. Uh, well, let me prime the pump for you a little bit as you engage your mind in this glorious pursuit. Now, I'm not, I don't have time to answer these things. I'm just going to throw them out there. Who is this person seated at God's right hand? Who is he? Think on that one. Why has God the Father ordained for him to occupy such a position? Why? What is he doing now while enthroned in heaven? What's going on? What's he doing? What are the implications for me as a believer individually and for the church corporately of his present position at God's right hand? And what are the implications, dear people, for history and eternity of his present position seated next to the Father. Man, this is just a few potential paths to have this mindset. Go take a walk and pray, people. Think. Think about it. And let me conclude verse 2 with this thought. As we said, this is the capstone of Paul's argument against errant false doctrine being promoted in the Colossian church. And, and I think this is really neat. Paul knows that a constant focus on the risen, glorified, enthroned Christ is the most powerful way to deal with the false, damning air of his opponents. Okay? The man-centered approach to God associated with the domain of darkness and the practice of the elementary principles of the world cannot stand when it is exposed for what it is by the brilliant beauty of the all-sufficiency of the Lord Jesus. You're having trouble with some of these things? Get your eyes on Him. Get your eyes on Him. And not only will it deal with false ideas, but as you behold Him seated there, what does Paul say will happen? you will become like him. Beholding is becoming. As you behold his beauty. You can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ and not be changed. You can't be. It will change your life. So Paul gives him the command. In verse 3, then, Paul states that the reason for giving the Colossian believers the previous exhortation that has to do with engaging their minds. He says, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh, my. His focus here, as he mentioned earlier in chapter 2, is on this marvelous new covenant reality of the believer's union with Jesus Christ. Union. This is our glorious position. It is this union that began at the moment of your salvation, my salvation, by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. 
It is this union that assures our transformation into the image of God. You've been raised with Him. The very power that raised Him from the dead is working in you to change you. And it's this union that assures our glorification, doesn't it? This union means that we are in Christ. And as Christ said earlier, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, man. The hope of glory. The word, the Greek verb, krypto, which translates hidden, in our context, dear people, carries a wonderful nuance, okay? According to the lexicon, it means to hide in a safe place. Man. Ah, man, to me, this is unbelievable. Just reflect on this heavenly reality, won't you? There can be no safer place in the created universe. You know, sometimes we feel so exposed and alone and vulnerable, don't we? Exposed, alone, vulnerable, hard-pressed. And the enemy tries to hinder our faith and whisper in our ear that God doesn't care. You're on your own. Dear child of God, remember this verse. You have died. And your life is hidden, hidden in a safe place with Christ, in Christ, with God himself. This is why nothing can separate you. Remember that great text in Romans 8? Nothing can separate you from the love of God for you in Christ Jesus because you're hidden in Christ with God. You're safe. Praise God for that. <clears throat> we need to hear that, don't we? Finally, in verse 4, Paul gives us a declaration of the eschatological hope that is prophetically associated with Christ's present enthronement at the right hand of God. And here's, excuse me. Uh, Here's the idea. Present tense reality must give way to future consummated reality. We're talking about what's presently true, but that's not the end, people. It's not the end. There's a consummated reality coming as God brings about the great events of the end times. And what's the purpose of those events? Is it about me and you? Primarily, no. Remember, before time, in time, and for all eternity, the purpose of these great end times events is in order to set His Son on display as the returning King of kings and Lord of lords. It's about Him, people. It's about Him. Contemplating Christ's present reign, I think, naturally leads to contemplating eschatological consummation. You can't stop there. (laughs) There are too many untils that have to do with the future. And Paul's focus here is once again on our miraculous union with him. And this verse as the others, is worthy of hours of worshipful meditation. Look how he begins. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed. Christ is our life. Christ is our life. We are in him. He is in us. You remember that great text in Galatians 2.20? Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Christ is your life if you're a believer. So let's pause here and have to ask, people, is Christ your life this morning? Is Christ your life this morning? Are you in him? Is he in you? Do you have this wonderful union with the living Christ that only becomes a reality by grace through faith in his finished cross work? Is he your lamb, your sin bearer, taking the fullness of God's wrath in your place under that hand of wrath for you? Well, let's just pause. I know there are some sitting here that uh, don't have this union that we've been talking about. It's not a reality for you. Maybe you're thinking, oh, man, this guy is ranting and raving, and you could care less about heavenly things. I got things to do, think through, give myself to. You could care less about the heavenly things, right? Or loving God with your mind. Oh, man, I'm in school. I got other things to give my mind to than that. There's no excuse. Either he is your life or he is not your life. Let me urge you, if that's, your, if that's even wafting through your mind today, if it's not a reality for you and you know it, let me urge you to come to Jesus this morning. Please, please come to Jesus. Embrace this risen, exalted, glorified Christ as your lamb. One day you're going to stand before him as your judge. Embrace him as your lamb your substitute sacrifice. Be rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Come to Him by faith, by grace, God's grace through faith. He will not turn you away. Will He? No, He won't. Not only is Christ our life, but there is a time coming when, when he will be revealed. Not if, but when. Jesus states, you remember Matthew 24, 29, and 30? But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. All who have ignored Him will face reality. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Not if, but when. You can read about this glorious appearing in Revelation also, 19, 11, and 12. Before we conclude, and we're close to finishing, let me encourage you not to shy away from thinking about the end times and what is yet to come as God brings about the glorious events that will consummate history and bring in eternity. All these events are designed to exalt Christ unto the glory of God. Eschatology, the study of the end times, is important, people. You know how I know that? Because Jesus in the Great Commission commands his disciples to make disciples by teaching them all that he commanded them. And in the book of Matthew, it revolves around five major discourses. And the last great discourse in that book is the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, 
where he answers the disciples' questions, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? That's part of what's to be taught to the church. Jesus wants you to know. He wants you to know. Paul talked about the rapture. And the coming of the day of the Lord and the Antichrist. And the resurrection to glory. John in Revelation described the coming judgment as well. He talked about the millennial reign of Christ. The great white throne judgment. And then the eternal state. Peter talked about the coming judgment and the new heavens and the new earth. It's all through the New Testament rooted in the Old Testament. Is it important to understand? Yes. I don't think it's spiritually healthy, and I know we joke about this, to flippantly dismiss the study of the great truths, these great end-time truths, by saying things like, I'm a pan-millennial. It's all going to pan out in the end. Okay. Or... I'm not that concerned. All I need to know and care about is that we win in the end. Okay. I don't think that's healthy. When we're commanded by Christ to understand. So, here's my exhortation. Be willing in love, in love, to engage your mind and learn even though some of these things are hard to understand. And there are different views with respect to interpretation of text. It doesn't mean you ignore them. Remember, it's not about you. It's about the glory of Christ that God's going to bring these things about. It's about His Son. He's coming again. All right. In conclusion... Paul declares to the Colossian believers and to us that if we are in union with him, if he is our life, then you will be revealed with him in glory. You will be revealed with him in glory. This is part of our individual eschatological hope, dear people. As Paul states in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his own glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. We'll be revealed with him. Oh, dear people, may this hope be the hope of everyone seated here this morning by God's wonderful grace. And this Christmas season, when you see the baby in the manger, look up. Please look up. Look up. See him as he is now, where he is now, and contemplate him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you for these four little verses that talk to us about the beauty of Jesus Christ, his present session in heaven, the risen, ascended, glorified Jesus. Help us to engage our minds, to truly have the desire to give mental energy and effort to thinking about these deep truths concerning his person and work and all that that means from all of Scripture. Please help. And this Christmas season, as we celebrate him, may we remember that he was born and went to a cross for us so that we could be part of this wonderful, eternal kingdom over which he will rule. And we will forever and ever and ever see the glory of God in the face of a human being, the wonderful Lord Jesus, who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end of all things, and who is the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star.
thank you for him, Lord. Fill our hearts with him today. In his name we pray, amen.